Has anyone got any questions? Or any comments? Comments are good as well. Anything that you've experienced and that you say, yeah, we've done this. It's been um, it's been um, working for us. So we have uh, um, Marcus. <coughs> yeah, uh, uh, you mentioned mentioned uh, a lot of wood, uh, food waste about restaurants and uh, everybody else, but uh, supermarkets and uh, are a big uh, part of that. Also, I mean, in Estonia, uh, we try to make it more like. Uh, the restaurants at the moment try to make it more like uh, green and local and everything like that but there's still uh, like the fine dining it's a uh, huge like uh, how do i put it in the right word it's like huge responsibility to be the best so you tend to waste food it's like uh, you need to be the best so you can't like uh, if you miss something up you need to throw it out and that's also a problem like how yes marcus that? and i agree with you fully and this is what I'm saying is that we can make individual changes um, within our industry, you know. Um, now, again, it's hard because, yeah, when you're working at the top level and you're aiming to be the best, with that comes an awful lot of food waste. You know, it really does, you know, food that could be used. So there's a fine balance between the two things. But, yes, I agree with you 100 percent is that, you know, like supermarkets are probably the major contributor to it. Um, but our industry could do more to maybe offset food waste. So that's a good comment. Thank you. Has anyone got uh, any other questions? Okay, don't be shy. It's not uh, really a question. But uh, you mentioned seasonality a lot. And I remember when I was doing, um, I was studying Japan's cuisine. Then I remember they also really fixate on seasonality of dishes. Like they have very seasonal dishes. So maybe that's some, something to learn or like a learning point. Absolutely, Argo, and uh, particularly with Japanese cuisine and Japanese food culture in particular. That's a really good example, by the way, because the food culture itself is based on seasonality. And, you know, individuals grow up understanding this, understanding the idea of the season being as important as the food product itself, it being in season. Um, and again, it's something that I, I'm deeply interested in, in, in that sense, and try to apply it is, is because, you know, when I say we, I don't mean, every, you know, everybody, like lots of people try different things, but like we as an industry, as a collective in particular, um, and particularly in developed countries, um, we've become a bit lazy about seasonality, or we've become just, we've ignored it to a point because we want our cucumbers in November and we want our strawberries in February and we want our um, blackberries you know again I just like each year I've gone back to you see a lot of people in Ireland doing it the wild blackberries um, growing on the ditches in September you know so August September and more and more people you see going back that they're picking the wild blackberries but because it's just that time of the year for them now you can still buy them in January inside it up but they don't taste the same you know, they don't taste the same. And what we're doing there, that that's creating, it goes back to linking everything together. That's creating a really large carbon footprint for the blackberries that we're purchasing because they're not grow. And I'll just use Ireland as an example. I'm sure Estonia, Finland, and the Basque country is the same way as well. Is that the problem is, is those blackberries have to come thousands and thousands of kilometers to be delivered into our stores. And that is a carbon issue. There's no doubt about that. Um, maybe it, it's, it's about education, Argo, because I certainly know in Japanese society, and I, I've done a little bit of study on Japanese cuisine, uh, in their society, like it is understood from a young age about seasonality. So education is a really important thing here as well, from a young age, 
you know so anyone else got any questions or comments Yes, I have some comments um, as I am a foreign who uh, live in Finland and some uh, picture, every... okay. Where are you? is it Indonesia some picture from her? <laughs> I am from Thailand. Thailand, oh, yes. I've been to Thailand a few times. Yes, so, um, as I am a foreign who live in Finland and every uh, world you're talking about the um, uh, food base and uh, as we, Indonesia also, sometimes I feel um, pretty to see uh, in the every autumn in Finland forest there was a lot of uh, berry and uh, vegetable and um, all those what we can uh, eat and uh, also not autumn summer uh, mushroom I noted that um, as a local what we have a mushroom uh, for the Finnish really thin they're not really like to eat the mushroom yet just some uh, picking uh, some and also some many of the company who, uh, some company who try to preserve uh, the mushroom to put on for sale. But for some reason, this kind of uh, mushroom become very expensive. I, I, I feel that how we can, this is very good topic uh, for me to, to looking at, uh, for the new generation, they don't like to eat the mushroom. They not even know the variety for the why forest, what they what we can eat from the forest. And and this is the thing that all oh, that what I saw, they just dumb those things away. It just go over because the mushroom is go over very fast. And people doesn't know what to take from the forest. And and, and, yeah, and when really it comes to sell. Yes, when it turned to sell in the market, it's so expensive. And and it's so little people who, who be able to, to have this knowledge, how we can tell new generation or someone to, to get into this. There's so many, in Finland, there's so many things. You walk into the forest, you will see a fish in the uh, lake. In, and you walk into the forest, you will see berry autumn you will see the mushroom fully forest but then all those is it's gone compared to my country whatever we, whatever we see from the forest we pick them and everybody seem like know what to eat but here they don't they just go to the forest oh i enjoy the fresh air but they have a lot of food but the way it is nobody preserve and try to introduce this kind of food to the local people, to the new generation. This is a nice topic. Yeah, it's it's a really good point you made, Sampis. And what you'll find probably is in certainly more Western developed countries is that we've lost those skills over the past hundred years. Um, well, we've not lost the skill. The skills are still there, but we're not teaching young yes. people as much about yes. food and about what's edible and what's not edible. And, I'm as guilty as anybody on this. So you know what I mean? It's up to me to reteach people as well. Um, and it's up to all of us in this room to, you know, even if we only teach one person, that's one person extra that can uh, relate back then. Like you said, we can walk into forest or here in Ireland, foraging has become big and down by the beaches, particularly in summertime, there's so much that's edible available around us. Um, that doesn't cost money. And like you said, it, it seems funny sometimes then that when they're picked professionally, packaged and sold in the supermarket, they're so expensive, yet they're available on the street. So it goes back some bit to education. And I don't mean education going to school and having to study for it and to get a degree in it. What I mean is that education from passing on the knowledge all right and being open to passing on the knowledge again all right so um okay tj yeah. talk to you soon thank you and um, and it's about passing on that knowledge all right and like i said it doesn't have to be you know like a classroom like this is really really good because we get to connect through you know think of it we four different countries here today and some of you are from different countries originally as well so like we've spread our wings around the world an awful lot today. But that's no good if you don't share this information. 
You know, it, like if you now share it with one other person, well, that's how many people? That's 50 people that now and, sort of and, have and a better understanding this, of it. I, I like to comment as, um, as I am a real experience who enjoy to work in the forest. As a Finnish forest in the summertime, they have a, a, like a box. When I, I mentioned to them, hey, what is that bug in English? Ah, I cannot remember now. It's uh, in infinite, they call bungi. It's the bug where they're sucking the blood and uh, spread the seed. And then when we're talking about it, hey, we go pick up the mushroom in the forest. We go and pick up berry. Oh, no, no, no. It's so dangerous. Have you get those uh, vaccination and so on? It's not easy for someone who going there looking for food and it, it's a, so pretty. At least it's just my, my opinion. I, I feel sorry. What you have, what we have, we live in Finland. We have a so great uh, forest. In Europe, there are green forests and food surrounding us. But not many of us try to, to create and looking for those food. Of course, um, it's, I, I, it's just my comment. I feel sad. Yeah, of course. And, and that's understood. And um, that's, why I'm saying is, is that what we need to start doing, and all of us, and that's the younger generation as well, guys, because all of us of the older generation, we're passing the mantle on to you. Um, and so it's your job now as well uh, to do this. But if we can share this information and get one more person interested in this or understand that the food is available, well, then we've done a good job because they have passed it on to somebody else as well. Um, and there's a thing called, like, we're not going to get into it today, all right? But I understand where you're coming from someplace. And again, like I said, um, there's different areas that you can investigate in this, and you can connect via email um, after with me if you're more interested and put you in uh, the right directions. Is that the thing called food sanitization, particularly in developed countries, is that we forget where our food actually comes from yeah. and what we can eat and what we can't eat, you know? So, um, and again, traveling worldwide helps people to understand about food. I mean, I, I've had the pleasure of being really well traveled. Um, I was teaching in your neighboring country uh, for a month, two years ago, or for six weeks, two years ago, in Laos, in Vientiane. Okay. And, you know, I, I stayed and I actually immersed myself in the local population. I went to the wet markets. I went up to the farms. I went out to the countryside and stuff like that. And I literally ate what they ate, but that's what I do. So if I'm in the Middle East and I go to the Middle East an awful lot, I don't go to the fancy restaurant. I go to where the locals eat. If I'm in Finland, if I'm in Estonia, if I'm in the Basque country, that's what I like to do. So it doesn't have to be all these exotic countries. Um, because I get a better understanding then of what we mean by local food. You know, um, I get a better understanding of how different individuals utilize food. And, uh, you know, prepare food. And this is also in professional kitchens in these countries as well. Because, again, a lot of it is, is that once we go into professional, and the comment was made earlier, and it's a valid comment, is when you go to the high end, is that, uh, you know, we want to be the best, most fabulous looking dishes. And um, we kind of forgetting about the whole food wasting or what we have locally beside us, which can be fabulous as well. Um, so again, it's an issue, um, but it's an issue that's e easily solvable. But we, we, you know, we just need to pass on those messages. You know, we need to pass on those messages, and, and, and that's really important. That's how we solve it. I think it was yourself, Marcus, that was saying this about the um, the high end restaurants. But it's a solvable issue. You know, we, we we can work on this. So, and it's good to see passion. It's good to have passionate people about this here, because, like I said, you know, I mean, I've got twenty years left. Of teaching that's it i'm going to retire and i won't be doing this anymore so somebody else has to take it up and they have to um talk about this and spread the word about this we don't have to become fanatical about this but if we can get one person to change their habits we've actually done a really really good job so we've really done a good job so thank you good commentary good commentary from everybody thank you thank you Okay, so um, what I'm just going to look at now is that I just want to put up here is uh, worksheet one, and I just want to share this with you. I don't know, did any of you get a chance to look at the worksheets and do some work on the worksheets that are available for you? Did 
Did anyone get a chance to do that? So we're just going to look at worksheet one. And worksheet one, what we're looking for here, so this is something just for yourselves, like you, you can, you know, you should be able to work on this more or less um, straight away, certainly when you're talking about your menus that you've designed and stuff, um, or your dishes that you've created and stuff. So, so utilizing the worksheet here, investigate 10 ingredients from your competition dish. Okay, now some of you may not have 10 ingredients in your competition dish, and that's okay. But the ingredients also include salt and pepper. So they are ingredients, you know. So if it is salt and pepper, there's two ingredients. Um, but investigate them. And again, it's something that I teach here in the university here in, um, in uh, Ireland, is that uh, when I'm teaching my product development students, and this is even like that they're in their third year or whatever, we actually go back and we start this again is uh, understand your ingredients. And that's really what you're doing with this worksheet. You know, where are your ingredients from? What do they do for you? What do they do for that dish? You know, where do they come from? What is their ideal season? All right. And it doesn't matter what ingredients that you have and that you, you, you've already conceptualized and you've probably semi-created at this stage or mostly created at this stage. So I'm not judging you on the ingredients that you have. What I'm saying is, do you know your ingredients? And that's a really important lesson for um, particularly young, adventurous cooks and culinary students um, as you go further in your career. What makes you a really good cook is not your ability to chop vegetables quickly. That doesn't make you a really good cook. That just makes you very good at using a knife. That's a very different thing. What makes you a really, really good cook and a good chef and a, you know, an, an intelligent chef is understanding the ingredients that you're using and what they do for you or where they come from. And also, do you have an alternative that you can use? So like I said, remember, plant-based diets is a growing trend, all right? Uh, I know when I was growing up in Ireland, I didn't know what a vegetarian was. Now, they obviously existed, but where I grew up in a very rural Ireland, we ate meat every day. That was it. That was the culture that I grew up in. We are meat eaters, um, which is ironic because we're an island, but we're meat eaters, not fish eaters on this island. And we're dairy eaters. And I didn't know what's, I honestly didn't know what they meant by vegetarians. And certainly not vegans. I, I'd never heard of a vegan. I've never met a vegan. And uh, never mind heard of a vegan. Um, but now, 50 years later, is that vegetarianism in Ireland is growing and growing. Dublin has the highest percentage of vegetarian and vegan restaurants in the world. Imagine that, Dublin. So the highest percentage per capita of vegetarian and vegan restaurants in the world. You know, if you had said that 30 years ago in Ireland, 40 years ago in Ireland, they would have laughed at you. They would have said, impossible, because we like our meat in this country. Um, but here we go. So it's definitely growing and growing more and more and more. So that's something to be aware of. So when we talk about an alternative ingredient, uh, you know, is there an alternative to, um, say, a fish that you have? Is there an alternative to a meat? So when you do this worksheet, that's really what you were looking at. Write down the ingredient name that you're using. What's its provenance? Where does it come from originally? And like I said, nobody's judging you on this. This is just for yourself, your own knowledge. Um, What's the ideal season? Uh, 2021 in Northern Europe. All right. So, um, and like I include the Basque country in that, in Northern Europe, even Basque country is sort of more um, Southern Europe it's to a point, um, but not on the Mediterranean. Basque country has an awful lot of sort of Northern European climatic um, similarities with Ireland and with uh, Western France. Um, so what is the ideal season? Because again, this is the time of year that we're in. And um, is there an alternative ingredient? So, you know, is there an alternative ingredient available out there? And just additional notes is anything that you might learn. A one line, two words, you know, it doesn't have to be big amount of writing. And that's not what you're judging on. I'm judging on your, or not judging at all, but your knowledge base. This is about you increasing that your knowledge base. 
and your knowledge base around the food that you're using. Because that's how we become really, really, really smart. And we go back to things like um, um, Marcus said and to some pit, what, what you said there as well. That's how we become smart, is by attaining knowledge. All right, more and more knowledge, and it helps us be better, better chefs and better, better cooks. And that's really, really important um, for yourselves to have a really good, strong career and not just be a processed chef where you just go through the motions and, yeah, you're just cooking fish for the sake of cooking fish or you're just cooking meat for the sake of cooking meat and that you don't understand what you're doing with those products. You know, like that's really, really important. And um, really, really important for you as a young chef. You know, I'm very, very passionate about trying to put young chefs on the right career path because it is a brilliant career. I've had an amazing career. I really, really have. It, it's, I'm, you know, I, and I'm lucky in life. You know, like I, I travel every year at least four, you know, I won't say four, so definitely two to three times every year. And I always try to choose different destinations around the world. Um, I have no ties here, so I, I can go off for a month or for a couple of weeks. And it all revolves around food. It really does revolve around food all the time. But understanding food, see, that's sort of thing. I want to attain more knowledge about food. I don't know everything about food. I don't know everything about um, Finnish food or Estonian food or the Basque region food. I know an awful lot about Irish food. I know that. Um, um, but then of all the other countries I've been to as well, you know, it's all about learning food. And this is why that little exercise that we're doing there is actually really important. Because how, what do I know about food? Well, I know where it comes from. I know what the ingredient is. I know if there's an alternative. And it just makes me a, a smarter chef. That's all. Just a smarter chef. Not a better chef, but just a smarter chef up here in the head, um, which should result in being a better chef at the end of the day, um, which is what you want. And then the other one that I just wanted to look at before the break is... Of course, if I opened it up, it would help, wouldn't it? So that's worksheet two. Um, can you all see this as well? Yes. Yes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so list 10, explain 10 factors that are influencing contemporary consumers with regards to dishes or menus and complete the columns accordingly. So we've also got to know our consumers wherever we are, all right? What do they want? Our customers, sorry, just a little. Consumer is another word for customer to a point, all right? So consumer. And like what factors are influencing them, all right? And that's actually, you know, something that we should do in every single different country that we work in or every different region that we visit because there are different factors that influence everybody. All right, so then that's really important to understand that. Like different factors influence different people. Sorry, I'm on the wrong sheet. All right, so so what's the factor? So is this, um, is it the climate? Is it the, the amount of people that live in cities? Is it a culture thing? Um, does religion have an influence on it? Because again, that's an important factor. Um, is it the food that's grown, that's available? Um, you know, that's a real interesting exercise to do for yourself again, just to attain more knowledge. All right. So, and that's self knowledge that you're going to be able to use at some stage in your careers. And um, it's also really good knowledge in when we're talking about sort of the competition and the pop-up restaurants is because the, the whole idea of a restaurant is, is that you're opening a restaurant to satisfy customers' needs, generally speaking. So if you understand what the customer wants and what they like, well, then you can adapt to that. You can still hold all your principles of provenance, of food sustainability, of locality, all that kind of stuff. But now you also know what the consumer likes what the customer likes all right and what's the factors influencing that so then you can develop your dishes and your ideas and your concepts um to fit in with that um 
overall picture. That's really important for being uh, a chef. Okay. And uh, that's really important in the long term for your sons. All right. It's maybe not so important now today, but it's good to start stimulating your sons on that. Um, but it's really important for the long term. Because after you finish in your colleges in Estonia and the Basque Country and Finland, all right, after you finish your time in your colleges, well, then you're going out to work. You're going to work in a variety of places. Um, and knowing your customer there is really, really important um, because you're going to have to create dishes to satisfy that um, and to satisfy that want and that need for the business. So those two exercises, guys, sort of um, within maybe sort of the next while, if you can, is that maybe trying to complete those exercises. Uh, if you want, and, and I have no problem, is that again, I'll be putting in my email address here for work is that when you have them completed, you can send them to me and I can look through them for you. And if I have any comments to make them in or corrections to make on them, um, I will also do that for you as well and send them back to you. Because I know you've got a series of lectures coming up now or you've got the modules coming up now at the moment. Um, but it's all very, very you know um, fast for you. There's a lot of work here. So um, feel free to complete those and send them back to me. And then I'll have a look at them and I'll send them back to you then with any commentary or corrections that I may have on it. So particularly those two items in particular, all right? Because they're going to help you in the short term um, with your pop-up restaurants and with your competition menus, okay? So guys, it's um, nearly half past 10. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Sorry, half past 10 in Ireland, I should say. My apologies, 10.30 in Ireland. So, which means it's getting close to 12.30 in Finland and Estonia. And uh, what time is this in the Basque country? Is this um, 11.30? I think it's 11.30 in the Basque country. I get confused because our clocks are going forward next week, I think. Forward or back. I forget about time. Um, um, so, what we can do so, guys, is that you can take your lunch now for 30 minutes. All right. And if everybody is back here in this room at uh, one o'clock Finnish um, Estonian time, um, 12 o'clock Bass time, and that will be 11 o'clock Irish time. So is that OK with everybody? You can take your uh, lunch break now and everyone back in the room here um, for 1 p.m. Um, or 11 p.m. according or 12 p.m. according. Is that OK with everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay, excellent. Well done. Okay, so I'll see you back here again shortly. All right, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>